Good afternoon. This name has always been uh, linked to the culture of thought. Rabbi uh, Rafi Feuerstein is uh, the uh, chairman of the foundation that carries his name. The foundation has got over 80 centers throughout the world, and it's uh, contributed uh, to the training of thousands of uh, educators and uh, educators, educators. Is the author of several books and papers, a specialist in the, the development of cognitive uh, tools to assess uh, thought and learning. He's come to tell us about uh, moving from critical thinking to critical learning. On the other hand, I've been asked uh, to apologize on his behalf for the change in rooms. And he's also told me that he's going to try and summarize his presentation in order to devote the last 10 minutes for questions. Should there be any? Order Saudis, good evening. Nice to be here. It's like a big family of people who agree that thinking is important that learning how to learn is important. But let me share with you a feeling which I, I collect here. And if I'm wrong, we'll have 10, 12 minutes to talk to each other. I hope, we'll try. And I ask myself, why do I hear here somehow, I don't know if the right word is bitterness, or frustration. A guy was talking about little pockets, islands, which big agree with us. But where are the politicians? Let's make a revolution. Let's make an evolution. As if the so intuitive, the intuitive ideas of teaching children to think, critical thinking, teaching teachers how to teach thinking. It's so intuitive. If it's so intuitive, why are we somehow lonely in the planet? Can we just blame the politicians? It's very popular in my country. Everything, it's raining, it's because of the politicians. It's hot, the politicians. So everything is the politicians or Shall we check ourselves also? Those who really believe that we have to teach children to think and to learn. It's so intuitive. And if you heard the music of this beautiful lectures, which I heard, the keynote speakers, wonderful lecture and inspiring of Professor Perkins and Professor Art Costa, dear friend, and everyone keep saying, it's so easy. Let's do it. It's so easy. Why don't we do it? So why not? That's first, I would say, question which came to me, inspires me from yesterday till now. The second problem I have is are our children, those youngsters, the young generation, aren't they really thinkers? How old are the people who in created this smartphone? My age? No. Mark Zuckerberg who changed the world with Facebook. How old was he? Bill Gates? All those young people who make applications and applications and applications, how old are they? In my country and in many other countries, if you are 35 years old, you have a problem to find a job. I don't know how is it in your countries. In many countries, it's a problem. Why, 35? Hey. Why young? Are they stupid? Okay, I doubt it. I don't think that they are stupid, they are different. And I want to add to the wonderful, wonderful uh, keynote speakers and the lectures which I heard, I would like to be the mouth of the young generation. I'm not young, but I would like to be their ambassador here. And all those questions, why not, why not, why not, why not, it's so easy. Could be that there are symptoms 
which reflect a culturally difference between, I would say, our generation, the generation of the adults, of the teachers, and the young generation. They are not stupid, just that, just, they are just different. Let's, and I want to come with a strategic, I would say, conclusion. Uh, and I would love very much to hear you, we won't have much time, but... So there are many models for critical thinking. We have them. We have many, many, many thinking skills, learning skills. If you would check the different presentations, I think 90% everyone agrees with everyone. Am I right? Everyone we talk about comparison and decision making, creativity, imagination. I mean, if I, if I would collect all the presentations, I think we'll find 90% of overlapping. Everyone agrees. So, but still, the question is, is the issue the cognitive skills, the critical thinking skills? Or what happens when we try to deliver them, to teach them? And in my point of view, and I'm telling you that's my, this is going to be my conclusion, that the most important thing is the question of learning, not of thinking. It means, if you want to teach somebody to think, he has to learn to think. And here is my question. Is there any peculiar, spe special, unique way to teach people to think? Or is it like to teach them algebra? Or geography? Or history? Do we teach to compare and to understand the instruction and to be creative in the same way we teach geography? I'm, we will say, I would say no. But here are the questions, just, just examples. Why is critical thinking not universally acquired? Why do individuals who have acquired critical thinking skills continue to make mistakes? Let me share with you terrible statistics. In the United States of America, that's what I learned from the internet, every year, 300,000 people die because of mistakes of doctors. 300,000 people a year. How many people live in Bilbao? <laughs> Half a million, okay. Okay, you, you get the point? Think, every year. I wish all the best to Bilbao and to its people. <laughs> How many people get out alive, but suffering? Not cured enough? Me, it will be much more. So doctors are smart? Yes, I hope so. Why do they make mistakes? What's wrong in the way they think? Why is it difficult, for example, for individuals with Down syndrome to acquire thinking skills? Is there a way to teach them to think? It means I try to bring your mind, and in a minute we'll focus ourselves on generation Y, but on the question, not so much what is critical thinking, but the main question is how do we teach? In our language, in the first language, my late father, I'll come to it in the mediated learning experience theory, we will talk about mediating thinking skills, not teaching them, mediating them. So, for example, if I'm taking just some of the most or models of critical thinking, which are, you know, Matthew Lippmann with his philosophy of, for children, and he would talk about critical thinking is a skillful, responsible, a, a, a thinking that co a conductive to good judgment because it is sensitive to context, relies on criteria, and is self-correcting. And tell me now, you can see the picture of those youngsters. Do you have them also in Bilbao? Yes? Yes or no? Yeah. Is there any country without this type of... You know, once upon a time I gave a lecture to a teacher. And a teacher is standing up and asks me a question. And when I answered, she was already Googling. So, hey, <laughs> lady, <laughs> you just asked me a question. No. And when I, 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 I try to be polite, but when I saw what is she is Googling it, it was not something urgent from home. 
It was a website of news. She just had to update herself about the current news with the politicians in Israel or somewhere else. So what's wrong? How can the frantic nature of this smartphone generation allow judgment and self-correction? How much time do you need for judgment and self-correction in a generation? You know, uh, one of the lecturers told, me, uh, told us uh, all the time, talk to your neighbor. So my neighbor was sitting five, uh, where is he? I saw him here in the audience. Five features. I said, let's WhatsApp to each other. We can talk to each other with WhatsApp, OK? We don't have to talk. I mean, let's SMS, <laughs> let's text to each other, OK? So one from there can text to somebody here, and it could be wonderful away. So how can we think about processes which take so much time on a nervous, nervous generation? Uh, Harvey Siegel would say, people who possess the critical spirit value, good reasoning, and are disposed to believe, judge, and act on, his, on its basis. That's critical, means it's a spirit. Ask, let me ask you, and here is the young man, and the tsunami is coming, and how can critical spirit uh, survive amongst the tsunami of the wisdom of the crowd? How many people think what? How many people, I mean, we are in a tsunami. We are not yet in the little Bilbao or in the little Jerusalem, where I'm coming from. We are in the global world, where millions and millions of people are part of our community. So what do you mean when I talk about individualism and self-correction and my spirit when I really uh, am part of the global uh, uh, critical thinking? Again, is reasonable and reflective thinking focused on deciding what to believe or do. Means my own, I'm, the, I'm controlling my own belief system with critical thinking, would say Ennis. But don't, can we talk about, you know, judging and having my own decision making and control on my life when I'm judged by the likes? How many likes did you get? How many friends do you have? What does it mean a friend, by the way? Hi, bye, ciao. What does it mean, a friend? Somebody which you drink coffee with, which you help, and he helps you? Somebody told me uh, in Israel, they he was shocked that he found that the friend of his uh, fifth grade daughter is a lady from England who has four kids already. Something is wrong here with this notion of via the Facebook, yes? What does it mean, friendship between woman with kids and a young girl in the elementary school sounds, sounds wrong. Critical thinking is the int intelligent use of all evidence and the solution of some problems say, uh, would uh, uh, suggest to us McPeg. But tell me, in a generation of ADHD, 30% of the kids somewhere in the Western world, 20, are somehow part of this epidemic of ADHD. Tell me, can somebody with ADHD really look for all the context and the details, and use all the evidence? That's a very nice idea for critical thinking. But it's a generation of ADHD. By the way, think about the child. And I'm saying it's not a retailing issue. It's a, I'm saying it's man-made. It's a new, by the way, it's a new definition. You can write it down. A forest a new definition, man-made ADHD. Think about the child who sits in front of the screen five hours a day, that's a statistics, four, five, all the time. That's, if you don't have ADHD, we lose the game, yes? <laughs> Try to play those games. Let's see. Let's see if, if you, with Ritalin, you'll for sure lose them. And then the child is coming to the class, and the teacher, the nice teacher is saying, hello, children. <laughs> Today is, she lost him. She lost him, he's still there. So if the teacher doesn't have ADHD, I think that's the, the most important message. We need just teachers who have ADHD. <laughs> if not, they won't survive in the classroom, and they don't survive in the classroom. So how can we talk about all those wonderful thinking skills, critical thinking in a generation who suffers from man-made ADHD? So the question is, if to survive in our era, is it just what we think is important for our kids? 
this will give them the jobs? With our thinking skill, they will survive? Or is it, a, 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 or should we leave our ideas? Is, do they have a different type of thinking? What should we do with that? And when the a, a guy, the, the professor guy just talked about, and he finished with a question if you were in the keynote lecture, isn't it important for the 21st century? Isn't it important? And if I would ask my kids, they will say, Father, honestly, no. No, we won't get jobs with this type of thinking or just with this type of thinking in a generation which is so associative. So let me share with you a little bit, and I would like to relate to a wonderful article uh, written by two uh, uh, sociologists in Israel, Almog and Almog, a woman and wife, woman, woman and wife, which tried to a little bit describe to us the generation one, why, which we really, those are the children, those are the schools, we talk about them. So uh, the group, we talk about group which uh, I would say was born from 18, uh, 1984 till the 2000. We are waiting for the X generation, for the Z generation. And everyone who knows a little bit about it says that the Y generation, Y is very soft relatively to the Z generation which we are waiting for. And this generation particularly, in the West, have grown up, I'm reading the second one, in a world a, 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 with technology, computers, internet, cellular phones. They've grown up in era with rapid changes. A, 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 and really, I don't think, if I would, I try to, to tell it to Professor Perkins, we don't need the hacks. The hacks are there. The hacks are there. How much percent of this machine do you use? Two, three, or five? How do you know to solve problems of this machine? I have my own technician. Her name is Achinoam. She's one of my kids. She's 17. And whenever I have a problem, she says, Abba, that's father in Hebrew, go drink your coffee, give me two minutes, everything will be settled. I don't understand what she has done. I think it's a miracle. I think it's a magic. I think it's a Harry Potter. I don't understand, and believe me, I use 5%. 5% is really because I try to be nice with myself. And when my wife told me, you know, Rafi, we have to buy a new microwave. I said, look, when my wife tells me to buy a new microwave, no arguments, yes, no, we went to buy a new microwave. We got a new microwave with a book which is bigger than the Bible. <laughs> I said, uh, then I told the Tal, that's my, then my, my wife's name, I asked her, okay, where do you have the week to read? The book, I'm not talking about understanding. The 25 uh, uh, programs, the lights, the music which is coming, uh, the multi-system, it eats the food, it doesn't eat the food. Don't ask me. So the book with a nice nylon is still there on the library. And we happen to use the new microwave in the same way, way we use the old one. And then I told the tiny tal, the wash machine, we didn't open the two books. And the new laptop with five books. And the new... It, Okay, you understand. So we are, <laughs> when I heard Professor Pagan said, we are hacked. Don't worry, we are challenged. We are all the time out of the box. We are not in the box. We forgot the box. Okay, so uh, let's go on. Who are you, the generation Y? They are used to quick stimulation, ADHD type of, and uh, fleeting stimulation means rapid, different, very rapid stimulation. Therefore, direct lectures, which uh, continue to be uh, the method used in academic studies, are for them just a boring broadcast. Now, it's not boring, and when Art was showing us this wonderful uh, 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 picture about the children who stand in front, uh, uh, in front of the uh, Chinese wall and they are bored, they are bored because they have it here. They have it everywhere. Don't teach them knowledge. They have, they have the knowledge there. So why are they bored? It's not because the teachers are wrong. It's because they are different. It's a different expectation, it's a different language. They have become a sl enslaved to the digital world, especially Facebook. Rarely are they able to succeed in focusing the full attention on the, on the lecture or the lecturer. And that's when Professor Guy asked, 
So why it's not important to, to be attentive? They are not attentive because they are not attentive. That's a different style of thinking. In general, they are not focused on one issue. And this like the quiet and patient, they need the music. I couldn't stand. If I would have to learn to a, a, a test in university, I need quiet. If they don't have doom, 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 tam, tam, and all the house is jumping twice, they cannot learn to a test. They're not the same. Is it just at my home? I need a support group just to see that I'm not alone in the world. The quiet, if it's quiet, it's, it frightens them. This is a multimedia generation. A uh, they jump, they flip to, from one experience to another, from one excitement, excitement to the next. I had a secretary from this generation in my institute, and after a year, she said, okay, I'm going. I said, where are you going to? I don't know. Could be to, to Georgia to, for one year, could be not. I said, but you need a salary? Yeah, I'll find them. Don't worry, I'll find a job. It's a different, it's a different type of... People in my generation, my parents' generation, they looked for something stable. Hey, we have a job, we'll have a pension, you know where you are. That's a different generation. They need the ex excitement. It's a different thing. They find it difficult to concentrate and immerse themselves in something. Because, not because they are wrong, because they are different. Okay, so if I want to, uh, um, I would say to somehow summarize the points which could be give us the profile of this generation. First of all, the content is available. Don't teach them too much knowledge because with one, before you, the teacher finished, they are in Wikipedia, they read everything about it, and they know everything about it. So everything is there, the good things, the wonderful things of our civilization, and we know that also the evil, the bad, the ugly things are there with a very little, just push the bottom, etc. Availability of devices. How much? You know, my laptop is, our laptops are already passé. Everything is here. How much does it uh, wait? You, you know this picture of the people who go here? You can see it everywhere. They sleep with it, they go, they pray, they learn. It's there. I mean, the device is there, it's flexible, and all the world is here in the end of your uh, hand. The whole, as I said, the whole world is in the palm of your hand. Everything is there. Before you finish the question, they have the answer. They googled it, and they give you the answer. So everything is in front of them. In the, everyone has, a, has, has access. So that's a the, that's the community. Everyone is there. And let me share with you a personal story. My wife doesn't like those devices. And she decided, I'm not in the WhatsApp. I'm not in the Facebook. No, I'm, I like the life. I don't know if you know uh, the kibbutz in Israel, but she came from a kibbutz. She was born in a kibbutz, and she's somehow from, from a different, uh, different style. But then she found that all the family gives the messages through the WhatsApp, and she found herself outside of the, the family, not the community. She understood that if she wants to understand that somebody got this and that, and so, she doesn't know anything. She all the time kids ah, yes, where do you know it from? Where the, uh, Ima, WhatsApp. So, Ima, Mama, WhatsApp. And she has the WhatsApp now. She's part of the family. Welcome back to the family. <laughs> Mother. OK. So if you are not there, you are not. That's a community. That's a community of children. That's a community. But it's a different type of community. It's a different type of interaction. And we know it. Stimulation of reality while remaining remote in actuality. What does it mean to be happy? Smiley. What does it mean to be sad? Negative smiley. What does it mean to agree? Like. Means we, we created a virtual world, and they live in a virtual world, where they try to, to share their emotions, but it is a very, very a, a artificial, for me, it looks very artificial, type of a, articulation. Ferentic and shallow. That's a little bit criticism. Looks shallow. The discussions, the WhatsApp discussions, the Facebook discussions. Everyone knows everything about everyone. How much can you know about my inner world, about my emotions, my conflicts, my issues? 
it's, it's shallow. That's, from my point of view, that's for my a generation. A, a, a online communication tends to become a concise, short, shallow, fast, and prepared with pictorial symbols. There are numerous amounts of people online who express themselves through the confines of limited characters, resulting in rapid and flimsy communication. Means something is very, very different in this world and fully engagement. Honestly, and I don't want to, to, to sound critis, uh, critical, but how can you fight with the engagement? Beautiful schools, beautiful communities, I like it. But that's a very strong, that that's really engages them. Honestly, again, I don't, let's see if I have the right solutions. But it sounds to me a little bit pathetic. That's a different world. Very engaging. <laughs> when I came to Bilbao in the flight from Israel, from Tel Aviv, I had two people, two business, young business people uh, 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 beyond me. And they, there was an argument in big voices, so I, I heard it. How long is this machine, should this machine, uh, is created for? Year or two years? So I'm saying, no, I have it three years. I'm, that's an archaeology, piece of archaeology from Jerusalem, iPhone 5, don't talk to me. I'm passé. I'm real passé. I was not standing in the Fifth Avenue full night to buy iPhone, what's today, six or seven? Six, thanks God it's not seven because then I would really, so it's engaging. It's there. It's strong. How can we compete with it? Honestly. But let's put the question on the table. It's, is it a matter just of a climate of a school? And it's again a good idea. Wonderful idea. I like it. Is it enough to make the change? But well, this is so engaging, and it's going to be more and more and more and more engaging and strong and holistic and intuitive. So what's the future? What are the solutions? We can, Sorando. We can. Just to say thank you, we lost the game. Please be the teacher. That's not us. We can fight. Or try to design a different paradigm, which will bring us to a new world, and then what's the model? And I can tell you that the question is bigger than my answer, honestly. But without real and honest diagnosis to the issue, we won't be relevant as teachers, and I'm afraid to say as parents, as grandparents, because that's an era. Where is the time when if I was a carpenter, my child was the carpenter, and my grandchild was the carpenter with the same machines? Can you give today the laptop to the second generation? <laughs> Does it value something? For how long, as I said before? Means, so what's the future about communication, education? Here, I would like to come, you see the beret of my father? For all the Basque people here. He was wearing it all his life with this Basque. He was buying them from a, I mean, I knew him for more than 50 years with this beret. And he was buying them from a shop in Barcelona specific. Once I went with him to go to buy the, those berets, they had to be in a very specific size. So that was his, I would say, symbol. So, uh, I don't know where did he take them from, when did he begin, I mean, much, much before he was married. So, he was talking with us, he was a student of Jean Piaget in the 50s, uh, for five years, he made his masters with Piaget, and the fact was that Piaget knew just France, he was a professor in Geneva, and he didn't talk any other language, but many, many professors from the world came to meet him. My father was talking, he was, my father was a Holocaust survivor, and he was the, talking seven languages. He came, escaped from Romania in the, in the war, in the Second World War, and he knew seven languages. So whenever was, came a guest uh, to Piaget, my father was the translator, so they, he became very near to his professor. Uh, and from Piaget, he took many of his ideas, but he shifted from him, and I tried to give point to it. He was saying that we talk uh, Piaget and Baldwin before Piaget, they taught us that 
our ideas, our experiences, are, all get, are not in a chaotic way, like my working table, by the way. I'm not so organized, or like some other things in my life. But he told us uh, that things are organized in structures. Means, if you think for about, let's take the idea of self-esteem. Everyone has billions and billions and trillions from the kindergarten of uh, experiences. The teacher told me this, that, parents, billions of little movies, mental representations. And how are they organized? So Piaget taught us that they are organized in schematas, in schemas. There is a very strong connection between them. We know it from our experience, how many times we take a child, we say, you are smart, you can make it. You know this smile? You can, you have it, believe me, just make homework, not homework, how did he say? Expansion, don't say work. So, home fun. Do the home fun and you'll enjoy life. And he will say, <laughs> means, and Piaget explained us, that it's because the structures many times are very uh, integrated strongly. And the little pieces of the puzzle are heavy connected. It's like an old city. I think all the time about the metaphor of the old city of Jerusalem. Just try to walk inside. If you don't find the Jaffa Gate, you won't find your way inside. That's an old city. And all the buildings are connected to each other, up and down, and etc. It's very hard to go inside a structure. So when I asked myself why my late mother had to tell me, Rafi, please, after you drink a coffee, take the glass back to the... I know that you don't have those problems here. You never heard about it. I'm a unique person. And I asked myself, why couldn't I? And I loved her more than any other thing. And the most important thing was for me to make her happy. But why did I forget to organize my room? Is it to forget? Why did I forget X, Y? Is it to forget? No. It was not in the structure. It's not to forget. So when Art Costa, in his wonderful presentation, talks about mental habits, that's a habit. Habit is something which you do without to think. Somebody is smoking and you cannot finish to smoke. That's a habit. Habit is something which is against metacognition, if you understand me deeply. Because metacognition means I control my behavior. Habit means I don't have to think, I do it. So mental habits are structures with strong interconnection, inter and intra connections. How can you make a change? So I would try to say, and I liked very much, and I used also this metaphor when Art was talking about the language of thinking skills, he said. I would like the child to say brainstorming. But it's not just a symptom. It's a way of thinking. He was talking about structures. Let's put the name. Habit is a structure. Many, many, many things together, which create a cluster. When it's open, then it's more easy to convince somebody. But when it's tight, it's very hard to change and to convince. The issue is that we here, with all the little differences, but I think we more agree than disagree, different institutes, different teachers, different schools, books, in the end of the day, we agree that we have to teach the children to think. Let me put it in the words of Piaget or the words of Feuerstein. It means to create a structure of thinking skills. It's a habit. It should be a habit. If to compare is something which is very hard to the child, he will never do it. If critical thinking, reflection, all the beautiful things which we were talking about, will be hard for the child, he will never do it. He will never do it. Habits, easy. Coming, going. But there are structures. And here I show two structures. The green one is the new, the, that's the generation Y. We are sitting on the big blue type of thinking, the linear thinking. That's what we talk about. But the new generation is coming with a different type. And I would say that those machines, coming back to all my descriptions, are very strong. 
they create an alternative structure. And you understand what I'm saying. It's very hard. When I have a conversation with one of my daughters, I have eight children, so I have many stories, by the way. <laughs> eight children with many stories. Uh, so when I talk with one of them, she's fully engaged in this machine. I say, Achinoam, let's say Achinoam. I'm not talking. Father, just one minute. I have to solve a problem here. I have to solve a problem there. When I sit with, in meetings in my institute, on other organizations, I say, I'm not talking without everyone puts it. It's hard. It's part of our blood system. So the new structure jumps in and is going to cover the old one. That's the bad news. Now tell me, to prevent it and to bring it, sorry, what did I do? And to bring it back, what does it mean? And let me give you the metaphor which I suggest, and I think it makes sense, and I would love to hear you. I'm talking about talking more than one language. Okay? I'm, my English, uh, the, it's a huge project in the United States, it's called English as a Second Language. I don't know how is it in many places in the world. In Israel, every child learns Hebrew and learns English. That, those are two structures, different. And they live together. That's easy. But there are other structures. Should I, as a president of institute, when I come home, we have hundreds of people in our location, in our institute, should I talk to my children in the same way I'm talking to my team members, uh, I mentioned that. Uh, we have a meeting uh, in 10 minutes, please. If I want to continue to be the beloved father, let me change the paradigm rapidly. <laughs> okay? And if you are the teacher and you come home and you act to your children as a teacher, God bless you. <laughs> so we all have more than one paradigm, more than one language. So, I like all the ideas, but one thing, you want them to think with the 21st skills which you believe they are relevant and I believe, that they are still relevant, it's not enough to talk about it a little bit, to create wonderful climate, it's a language. How do you teach a language? Do you teach a language inside history? Or you teach it outside history? Do you teach math inside physics? Or you teach math outside physics so the child can apply it in physics? Apply it in statistics? Apply it in, 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 in whatever? So there is a way to teach language. Thinking skills are language. It's a paradigm. It's a structure. So if we honor the field which we believe that it's so important, and I am one of them, we have to take it seriously. I'm not saying the other ideas are not serious. They are very serious. But they should rely on very solid, strong structure. If not, it won't survive. And honestly, as Professor Guy said, we have little islands somewhere. We have, thanks God, in our institute, we have 84 training centers in 40 countries. But the world is big. The world is huge. And we are not, all of us together, this coalition, we are not, we are a minority. Policymakers, which we like not to, to dislike, if there is a problem in reading, in literacy or numeracy, they will give more easily hours and money for literacy or numeracy. Tell them that all the hours won't work if the child cannot think literacy. But they need short, and I'm not criticizing them. It's a difference. We have to begin with understanding that we have to teach language. And my father dedicated his world to this method, to this model, if you want, which is the model of what he called the mediated learning experience, Google it, find it, it's all over, uh, it's all over. I mean, it's much beyond his work already. And he claimed, and let's say, see if you can see it with my mouse. Can you see it? There are two types of learning. One type is the direct modality. That's S for stimuli, H for human, 
or for organism or the child or the student and R for response. He said there are two modalities of learning. One direct. That's the majority of learning. You hear me, I hear you, I see you, you see me, we go, we see. That's the majority of learning. The direct stimuli. But there is an indirect stimuli which he called mediated learning. When the age, the human, the mediator, it could be the parent, the teacher. It could be a museum. It, it takes the stimuli and changes it in a way that will create a thinking or learning skills in the child. And let me be, uh, explain, bring it a little bit down to earth. But that's, in his way, this modality is responsible for creating solid thinking and learning skills. Let's take it seriously, he said. It's not to teach in this way, like we teach other things. It won't create a structure, especially in our era, when there is a competition. Such a strong competition. And believe me, we are young, a little bit younger and older, but somehow the same age. I don't think that I remember in my, when I was a child, such a competition between two types of thinking, two types of learning. That's a different area, that's a different era now. We have to understand it. So here, it's much more critical. What does it mean? And he said, okay, where am I now? Okay, you understand technology and uh, let's blame the technology and uh, all the stuff, the politicians. So, he talked about three parameters which are necessary for mediating. A, intentionality, means, if I teach you now, I'm teaching you now, I don't know if you're interested or not, I hope so. I don't know if you understand me or not, I'm sure you are much beyond me. I don't know if you agree with me or not, that's not mediation. I don't know if I entered your schema. I don't know. I don't have a way to know with hundreds of people who sit in this room. But if I want to mediate, it means that I take responsibility. That my message will enter the schema, the structure, the paradigm of the mediating. I will do many manipulations. How much should I talk? How shall I say it? When? How to articulate it? Should he or she talk with me? What's the setting? I'll have to architect the classroom, the school, and here many of the brilliant ideas are very relevant. It falls, it falls into the idea of intentionality. Intentionality, again, means I take the responsibility to enter the structure. If I won't enter the structure, I'm outside the town. If the child is polite, he'll say, yes, teacher. If he's not polite, he will, won't be polite, but I won't change him. The second thing is mediation of transcendence. Transcendence means I want to create a strategy. It's not a concrete thing. If you teach something concrete in math, it will be in math. But if you want something to be much more meaningful, it should be all over. So make the connections. Create, take the initial stimuli, the initial strategy, and link it to other areas. It's wonderful to see, and I won't touch any more than that because time is running. We were a little bit late. I have five minutes more? Seven? I don't know. Because of the change of the, of the, of the auditorium. But it's very, it's, it amazed my father in his last years that his assumptions are very near to the new findings in neuroplasticity, which becomes a very popular, a very popular a, 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 a way of thinking and research in neurology. And it was found that if you want to create changes, not changes, not just in the mind, but also in the brain, not just in the way of think, but also on the hardware, not just on the software, but also on the hardware, the R, that's a meta, that's an outcome of a meta-analysis, which you have the reference, 2008, which took many studies and tried to understand what are the stimuli which are making change in the connections between the neurons in our brain. Activation effect means you have to activate the child. It's an idea which came out from many speakers. And then repeat, 
repetition effect. That's a very important thing. Yes, it's not so easy to make changes in the brain. If it's not repeated, if you think, I teach now a strategy, and I made a change, and that child understood me, no. Don't be surprised the doctor will make a mistake. He will make a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. But he will make mistakes. Why? Because it's not enough. It's not hit and run. I give you, huh? you understand me? OK, wonderful, let's go on. No, no, no. You want to make changes? Work on it. Repetition effect. But an intensity effect. We talk about, when we talk about teaching or mediating thinking skills, not less than two hours, real two hours a week, two to three hours. It's a language. Try to teach foreign language with a little bit uh, here and there. Does it work? It's a language. My friends, it's a language. We're in a huge competition, as I mentioned. So intensity effect. There is also another point which I mentioned, I cannot mention all of them, the novelty effect. It means you cannot just repeat and repeat the same principle. You need also challenges. So it's a balance between repetition, intensity, and novelty. This brought, a, a, in the beginning, my father, and then later me with him together, to create, a anti, I would call it antibiotics, antibiotics of mediation. That's a program which is called Instrumental Enrichment, or PAY. People know it in different kinds and different ways. Which, in the end of the day, say, let's give two, three hours with a real mediation. It's not teaching. Mediation of different thinking and learning skills, which we believe are relevant also in the 21st century. It's a second language. There is the intuitive language, the rapid, intensive language of the generation Y, and there is the most solid way of critical thinking, which we believe it. And then that's the way we help the teacher. Because, you know, just with understanding that you have to talk about it, it's, you have to be practical. And you have to teach mathematics outside of physics, then bridge it to physics. First of all, teach it outside. Create a solid structure and then use it, yes. We teach it for using it. But that's the way. And then there are also instruments which we believe should begin in the nursery school. That's the way we mediate comparison. Teaching, mediating the child to use concepts. Okay? Like size, like we work, that's part of the curriculum. It should be part of the curriculum. Yes, it's expensive. It's not expensive to train the trainers. It's expensive to find the hours. But if the child won't learn systematically how to compare, just from telling him compare, compare, it won't make the change in the world, in the ADHD, the world of ADHD. That's every such a page is a lesson. It's a 45 minutes of lesson, and we train the teacher to use it, in this case, in the early childhood. Here we talk about orientation in space. OK? Here we prepare the child to the idea of the number. For in the Piagetian thought, number is a group of elements. To addition means to merge. Subtraction means to separate groups. We prepare him to this, and I have to rush and to run because I want to talk with you. In this case, we talk about perception. The child who can see text, and for him, it's many dots. Let's teach him, let's mediate with him how to organize and to, and to orient his perception. OK? And et cetera, et cetera. I will just show you a very nice tool which deals with mediating emotions, thinking emotions. Now, what happens to this woman? What does she feel? Is she surprised? Is she surprised but sad? Is she surprised but happy? How much happy is she? How do we know it? Let's look on her eyebrows, on her eyes. We mediate and we teach the child how to, and then which situation fits the emotion. It's a serious work. It's not just here and there. It's part from empathy to action, solving a conflict. Let's train them how to solve conflict. Mediate it. It's a serious part of the curriculum which we believe in. I uh, think that if I want to talk with you and I want, I have to finish now. Am I right? So 
I wanted very much to share with you a project. I wanted to share with you some evidence. It's a very evidence-based program. I just said it's a program which we took Ethiopian students in Israel. Because of cultural difference, they failed, couldn't come to academy. We assess their learning profile. We call it dynamic assessment. Learning, it's all about learning. And we found those efficient learners who failed in the psychometric tests, which are the gate, and we have them uh, successful, and I leave all the statistics for the next visit. I want just to thank two people. Okay. One of them is my father, and the other one is my son. His name is Elhanan. He is today 26 years old, uh, not so young as he was, and like me, like everyone. And he is our second child, and he has Down syndrome. And he brought me to work with my father, honestly, uh, 26 years ago. I'm a rabbi. I began in a different career. But after he was born, I was 29, my wife 23. It choked our life. And I decided to be with you today and uh, not to do other things. Uh, Elhanan finished with our method, regular high school, with full matriculation. Uh, he is now working. We have a project in Israel. We use it also for disabled people to prepare them to work with the elderly. Wonderful project. Two th sorry, 1,500 hours of learning, psychology, communication, studying, seriously, changing the paradigm, changing the brain, changing the structures, with the same method, by the way. And today, El Hanan is part of a project which we hope to bring, to bring the world to prepare youngsters, disabled youngsters like him, to prepare them for marriage, for having their own families. Because in the end of the day, if you mediate thinking skills, you make them flexible. And I ask myself, and I finish by that, it makes me crazy, this question. It makes me restless, and I tried Ritalin, and it didn't work. How come that so many normal children in the world I don't know exactly what's normal, but let's assume that for now. How many normal kids drop out from schools, are in the streets, with wonderful brains? Though this is the population which concerns us. How come that my son could make it and they know? And they are 20,000 times more smart, smarter than my son. So that's, let's begin to teach them seriously to think and to learn and to make it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some questions? Hey, thank you very much, doctor. Eh, no sé si alguien tiene alguna pregunta. Tenemos un micrófono. No sé si hay alguien de... Si alguien quiere hacer alguna pregunta, tenemos 10 minutos como máximo. Eh, I wanted to ask you, eh, what features, what qualities do you think a teacher should have to teach uh, the white generation? Okay. He has... Uh, did you translate the question? Ah, it was translated. The question was, what are the, the features which such a teacher needs? And the answer is, he has to become a mediator. Mediator means he's not destroying the child, he's teaching another language. But the first thing which you have to do, and here is Karen, which invited me, thank you, Karen, to this conference. I think, and I have a suggestion, I think in the next conference, we have to begin to think to understand this generation to understand them from an empathic place, not from a critical place, to understand the way they, they innovate those wonderful technologies. Who are they? And I think first thing is to learn who are they. Second thing is to respect. Third thing, to teach them a language, a second language. You're wonderful as you are, but you need another language. We need to develop it much more, but for now, ¿Alguna pregunta más? No sé si alguien quiere... Es que se han llevado el micrófono. A ver si conseguimos... Por eso está el micrófono. Ahí está, sí. ¿Quieres que me lo haga? ¿Quieres que me lo haga aquí? Ok. Gracias.
Ya, ya, ya. Muy bien. Sí, felicitaciones por su presentación, profesor. Eh, yo vengo de la Fundación 11, que es una fundación que en España se dedica a la inclusión de personas con discapacidad eh, a través de la educación y el empleo, fundamentalmente. Y me gustaría que. Unemployment, and I wish you could tell me how you've applied this method and what uh, learning systems uh, are you uh, using for this. Uh, collectivity of people, which for us is a priority. Thank you for... I wish uh, somebody could uh, give the speaker some headphones, because I could be translating instead of doing this. Translation to tactile language for blind people. I mean, the method is today translated to tactile language, which we try to bring to the, to, to the blind people the thinking skills which are missing for them, I'll give you a little example, a little research which we have done. We took students in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, it's the best university in Israel. And we took blind students who were studying there. We asked them to draw an airplane. What do you think we got? Many windows, separated from the wings, separated from the body of the airplane. So we understood that because they lack the visual, holistic type of looking, they are episodic. That's just a little example. How did do we use our method to help blind people? And if you're interested with our ways to train people in the world to use it, I'll just tell you that we use it today for ADHD children. Because the ADHD child, and that's wonderful, it's going today very strong, needs to slow down. What's his problem? He sees everything. Ah, and he cannot regulate his behavior. But when you slow him down by sequential type of input, you understand what I'm saying? One, you cannot take it, if, if I ask you, close your eyes and try to see what is this object. So you have to take it and then integrate it. So we slow him down and then we teach him to integrate and then we apply it to the visual. It's a all wonderful thing. But to your second question, if I understood it well, look. And that's very, very strange, I would say. If you ask, when I'm asked the first method, with whom do you work? We work with retarded people or uh, special needs people, we work with gifted, we work with pilots, with engineers, with doctors, with regular schools. Why? Because this, we are very much theory based. And this idea of mediated learning, that's the way every person we hear, that's the statement of the theory. We were mediated by our parents. Mediation is not something which Professor Feuerstein designed. He discovered it. He found, he made a lot of research all over the world to see how do we interact when we try to teach thinking and learning skills naturally. So that's the operating system of our mind. And it works for everybody. If I take a computer and I break it five times down, it's the same computer. And if I have a computer who is a wonderful, but that's, and I want to upgrade it, it's the same operating system. So we are working on the operating system. I just gave you a little taste of this operating system, which is called mediated learning experience. I hope I answered. Nos queda tiempo para una pregunta, me parece más. Si alguien quiere alguna pregunta más. No. Pues lo dejamos aquí. Professor Feuerstein, thank you very much. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Honest.